Uh, this lecture series, uh, my name, by the way, is Nitin Sahani. I'm a lecturer and research fellow in the program. And I'm taking Uta Neta Bauer's place, who directs our program, who is unfortunately traveling uh, this week. Uh, the lecture series that we've um, begun this, this term is called Collision 2, when artistic and scientific research meet. And it's really designed to bring together artists and scientists uh, in different disciplines working on artistic methodologies and scientific work at the intersection of um, architecture, science, technology. So through the course of this lecture series, uh, we hope that we'll develop a better understanding of what artistic research means and can mean through a series of artistic projects that we'll be exposed to. And in, each, in every one of these lecture series, we'd like to bring both the artist and a respondent, in many cases, uh, a, sci a scientist or a professor here at MIT, to sort of bring another perspective and complement the work that they're talking about. Uh, before I introduce this week's session, I just want to mention uh, next week, March 7th, uh, we'll have an artist uh, visiting us as well to speak about his work. His name is Laurent Grasso, and the title of his talk is Science and Fictions. He'll be talking about work he's been doing uh, at a base uh, in Alaska on what he calls high-frequency active oral research. And our respondent will be Stefan Heinrich, who is a professor of anthropology at MIT. Um, so through a series of uh, five or six lectures that will happen every Monday evening, I hope uh, you'll continue to join us and uh, contribute to those lectures. This evening, we're very uh, pleased to have a fantastic um, a pairing of artists, um, both here for a week, a sort of mini residency with us. Uh, Guillermo Favovic and Nicholas Goldberg are both here from Argentina. Um, and um, I'll introduce their work fully. And our respondent is Professor Richard Benzel uh, here at MIT. And I'll give you sort of a brief bio for both of them. Um, but just to introduce the, the topic itself, uh, they'll be introducing a project that began nearly five years ago, uh, and they're calling it a guide to Campo del Cielo. I'm just going to read the abstract. In 2006, Guillermo and Nicholas began working on a guide to Campo del Cielo, a project that revolves around researching the cultural implications of the meteorites at the Campo del Cielo site by studying, reconstructing, and reinterpreting their visual, oral, and written history of that site. Uh, their aim is to identify the historical contemporary impact of the site and their ongoing work. In 2010, their exhibition, uh, Meteorite El Taco, was held at the Porticus in Frankfurt uh, as part of the Documenta uh, uh, sort of curatorial series, and that will be again held in the exhibition in 2012 as part of Documenta. Um, now, just to talk a little bit about but um, the, the artist, let me just give you a little bio. So, Guillermo and, and uh, Nicholas have been working together for almost five years now. And uh, they've been uh, doing this as part of a grant by the Ministry of Science and Technology in Argentina uh, for artistic interventions and programs in Buenos Aires. And it's, it's also an artist residency that they've been conducting in Frankfurt. Uh, they both live and work in Buenos Aires. Uh, Guillermo was born in Buenos Aires in 1977, and since 2000, he's been, he's been featured in many solo and group shows uh, across Argentina as well as abroad. Uh, he did a, a residency in Frankfurt in 2008 and 2009, uh, and he also developed some video art exhibitions, uh, which are site-specific works in Buenos Aires. Now, Nicholas has more of a photography background. He was born in Paris in 1978 and lived between New York and Buenos Aires. Uh, he underwent a two-year residency with the International Center of Photography in New York, and um, in 2004, his monograph, Al Kandan Dito, explored the experience of politics and spectacle when he spent three months with the ex-president of Argentina, Carlos Menem. Uh, this was featured in Madrid uh, as part of an exhibition. And he's again had many solo and group exhibitions in the US, uh, Spain, Italy, and Japan. And he's been awarded a, a fellowship with the Photography Center uh, in Buenos Aires and continues to work with photography. So uh, they'll both be um, talking about the investigation. Now, as a respondent today, we're very uh, pleased to have Professor Richard Benzel. He's the professor of planetary science 
at the Department of Earth, Atmosphere, and Planetary Sciences at MIT. Uh, I'd like to thank Patrick Heimbach, who is uh, here as a researcher, who introduced us to Professor Wenzel. Um, well, Professor Wenzel has been here at MIT since 1988, and he was just joking to me that most of the students are much younger uh, than that time. Um, he published his first scientific paper at the age of 15, uh, which I believe was on asteroids? Or? Yes, it was. <laughs> um, and I only know this because uh, there was an article in the Boston Globe uh, yesterday which cited Professor Wenzel. He completed his dissertation in astronomy at the University of Texas. And uh, what's intriguing is that uh, Professor Wenzel has been working in a uh, planetary definition committee in the last couple of years, which has been trying to decide about the status of Pluto, whether it's considered a planet or a dwarf planet or a asteroid. <laughs> uh, Professor Benzel firmly believes that it should be granted full planet status. Um, so you can ask him about that. Um, but I think that most of his research today uh, has to do with um, asteroids and meteorites. And I think that he's one of the foremost um, experts in this area that we could bring uh, to discuss this with our others. So with that, let me uh, begin our conversation. And this is really meant to be a conversation uh, when uh, I spoke to Guillermo and they were sort of lunch today, they said they didn't want to do what is conventionally an artist talk with a set of slides and a presentation. The reason they're here as part of the residency is to have a conversation with scientists um, and researchers at MIT. Uh, so we will we'll try to have it as a discussion and, and see where it goes. So let me try and just start this off um, by quoting a brief um, <coughs> from the curator of the last exhibition that was held uh, in Frankfurt. Uh, the curator Carolyn um, Bergaglio and Daniel Birnbaum uh, both spoke about uh, the work. And one of the first questions that Carolyn asked was, what is in the world that is older than the world? And she was referring to their exhibit. Um, they have a series of conversations about this issue. And then I think Carolyn very uh, nicely sort of tries to bring out what Campo di Silio means uh, in this context. It's a meteorite field about 1,200 kilometers north of Buenos Aires in Argentina. And it's been known since the pre-Columbian inhabitants of the region since the late 16th century. Uh, although it was only in the late 1700s that scientists were convinced that these meteorites indeed fell from the sky rather than were terrestrial. Um, so for Carolyn, it's this reunification of the meteorite that the, the artist Guillermo um, uh, have attempted to do. And for her, it's a joyous celebration of this reunification that she found very intriguing as part of the exhibit. So let me turn to the artist and, and pose this question. Uh, why study this meteorite? Why does it fascinate you so much as artists? Go ahead. Um, well, I think it's uh, related with our interest in a way the meteorites and cosmos get us together as a, as a working team. But in a way we feel that the meteorite itself is uh, it's an excuse in a way, it's a case study for us uh, that uh, gave us like many, gave us, um, it, it really asked us to work, like sometimes you work with questions that uh, runs uh, out of uh, power very fast and this is like, uh, we, we, we really were, we were working with a case study that was asking us all the time to keep on working and keep on researching. It's like, a, it's like if it were like a third person between us. I don't know, if we were working with something that is just run out of power, we would move forward, but this always kept on. We, we began with very simple questions to work. And, and it kept on, on asking us to keep on working and to keep on researching. That's why we, we work with Campo de Silo until today. We have a lot to do yet, even if we did such a big movement like the one that you're looking here, there's a lot to be done yet. Yeah, and um, I also, I would add to that also that um, in the beginning our interests were 
we're sort of, sort of primitive. You know, we've been working for five years already. So our first approach to, to this story was sort of very basic. Like, there's this place in the north of Argentina where um, an asteroid fell 4,000 years ago. And, uh, and nobody really knows too much about it in Argentina. Um, like, you would ask anyone, do you know, like, in the north of Argentina, like, a 800-ton asteroid shattered in the atmosphere and et cetera, et cetera. And people would say, like, where is it or et cetera. So at the beginning, we were interested in it in a, from a formal point of view. Like, let's go out north and set out to look into this story. But as we began to research, we found out that it had so much history to it that like he was saying, like we started digging and digging, and, and, and this story was asking us to go deeper and deeper. And, um, and when, I guess, we're watching this. This is, a, this is a, a, a completed stage of our project. Our project is, is, is about this, this meteorite fall, uh, and there are many stories within this fall because it has such a... It has a 4,000-year history. It's been recorded by, uh, through oral history by the local tribes, and then Spaniards arrived there thirsty after medals, and they were taken there, and that's how the first accounts were written down in the late 1500s. And then science arrived. And, but uh, when, we, when we began working on this story, Guillermo was saying that we, at the beginning we were sort of wondering around with this very simple set of questions. And when we arrived to the planetarium of Buenos Aires, we were doing this, this census. We were going over institutions that had uh, Campo del Cielo meteorites. And uh, when we arrived to the planetarium to, to sort of see what was going on there, we saw this half that's sitting on the right. And, um, and we wondered, well, you know, where's the other half? That was like basically the question. And we walked into the planetarium, and we met some of the people that worked there. And they were like, what are you talking about? What, what do you mean, another half? And we're like, listen, that looks like it's been cut in half. We don't know. When did it arrive here? We don't know. Do you have paperwork for it? No. So that set out like a very strong uh, impulse uh, for us. Like we began to work to sort of say, okay, this is like an orphaned stone outside of this institution. We got to give, give back its identity. So I think this is what triggered at least this, this story within our project. And I think, uh, I don't know if that answers you. And then how did you proceed? Uh, this is a five-year journey you've been taking. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about where this journey has taken you. You've gone all over the world because of this rock. Yes. Yeah, because um, of course Campo del Cielo has a very much of an international status in some sense. Uh, in not only because the Spaniards were there in the in the 16th century, but because the first missions, very important scientific missions that were conducted there, were in the 60s, uh, led by an Argentine Argentinian an American Argentine commission, like joint expedition that was founded by the National Science Foundation. And you must know Bill Cassidy. Sure. And, uh, and he was exploring Campo del Cielo because he was, man hadn't arrived through the moon yet. So they were interested in doing these comparative studies of craters. And, and he, he sought Campo del Cielo as an opportunity. And, uh, and he actually unearthed many large specimens. He, he was responsible of finding the second largest meteorite on Earth, which is 37 tons. And it's sitting out there in the open air. And, uh, and he, uh, he found El Taco. So we were you know, researching. We found papers. And that took us to, OK, like, we have to see Bill Cassidy. And that's how it all started, I guess, the international part, no? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, we kind of follow the story as it was coming to us. Like, uh, first uh, we had this question, where is the other half? And it wasn't that easy to answer it, even when we were like emailing with the Smithsonian, they, they didn't really get our question. Like, they understood that we were interested on El Taco and 
they had archives how tentacles of this uh, come over. But when we got there and they began to first they they took us to a to a lab where they said, okay, this is a taco. They opened a drawer, they took a little sample of this little taco. So then we're looking for the big thing. They said, okay, come over. And they took us to the exhibition hall and there was a slice. And that was very shocking because we were looking for the other half. And in that moment we learned that there were slices. And we said the curator, the main curator, uh, no, we're looking for the other half. And he didn't understand what we were talking about. He said, no, oh, you're looking for the bad. Well, we don't have that. He said, yeah, you should have that. So they took us, he took us to, to, to his office and began to look into his papers. And after an hour, he found, like, uh, like a, in, in the inventory, he found that they have it in, in a storage facility outside uh, Washington. So he took us there the other day, the day after. And we we got to photograph it and make some video. And at the end, we look at the chair and we said, "It's easy. What we want to do is to get these uh, two halves together." And that was 2007. So we told him, and he said, "Well, yeah, it makes sense, but we won't uh, give this to you because uh, Smithsonian never gives, uh, never uh, lends uh, uh, specimens to individuals. You need a." an institution, an important institution, and you also need a very good reason to, for us to lend this piece in a, in a date and not 10 years after. Why do it today if it was in storage for almost 50 years? So then our job became to, to try to, to, as we call, we, we invented this, this term that it's uh, like, how do we say it? Uh, institutional engineering. Because we have to get together like a, a table with people that, that from different institutions that were like agreeing to do it. Like nobody really had to do it. So we, we really had to put together like a team of institutions to, to do this. And well, it took us three years and until we didn't see the two boxes with the mitras, we were not that sure that it was going to happen. So yeah, I guess. Well, and in the other side, we had like a lot of questions like, uh, okay, why is this here? Why? We had like a lot of questions when it was cut, it, like maybe it was more historical questions, but it seems to be important to, to get like uh, the thing together, to reconstruct. The, because uh, when we were, we were like selling something, when we, were to, when we went to the, to the uh, Ministry of Technology and Science and you know, we, we had like to pitch the whole thing and we really need to know uh, what we were talking about and I don't know, well, like we, we really like to speak, uh, to tell the truth when we speak. So, so we, we had to, to, to go over all the information and to make interviews with people why this half is here in the planetarium, when it arrives, when it was before, and try to get the letters and all the paperwork. We, we were really after every piece of paper or every, like, we interviewed the people that, uh, that moved the meteorite. Like, we were asking, so who was involved? And uh, people said, ah, I remember that this guy, so we were like after every piece of information to try to put together the history. And at the end is what we put it in, into the book. When we did this exhibition, we realized that in the room we just needed the mitra. We didn't want to put pictures of pieces or pieces of information. So we realized that we needed to do a book without to put all the information inside and to clear the space in the room just to show the mitras, the mitrites. Two halves, or one half, because we knew that uh, the exhibition could have existed with only one half, or maybe nothing. Like we were, like pushing very big institutions to bring the meteorite. So if uh, if if no rock uh, show there, like anyway, there was like this big institution that had to respond to that. It could have been a metaphor of institutional. Uh, institution and cooperation. As it was at the end, everybody was happy, but it could have been different and it would have been anyway. Like
something, like an empty room, it was a meter, well, they couldn't bring it. So I think I'll come back to the exhibition itself and the book project and your artistic process, but maybe we can start um, by asking Professor Benzo, um, why is studying meteorites uh, important from a scientific point of view today? Sure. So uh, I just wanted to say that uh, the happiest person to have our, the happiest entity to have our guests visit is uh, Campo de Cielo Meteorite. I have a sample here. I'm the curator of the MIT Meteorite Collection. It's largely a teaching collection that comes into the classroom. And so we've had Campo de Cielo here for about 20 years, just waiting for you gentlemen to come <laughs> and visit it. So this is not the main mass that we've been seeing in those gorgeous uh, video, but it's a piece of the very meteorite. And so uh, just from a sense, and I'll have these down here and hope invite you to come up and see these and many others that I'll talk about. When you pick it up, you see how heavy it is and you can imagine the, the mass of the uh, two halves that, uh, that you work so hard to, to bring together. So anyway, so here's a, here's a, a small representative of the Campo de Cielo meteorite here. So uh, meteorites have held a fascination for, uh, for people, but there's a, there's a scientific uh, fascination for them as well. And if I can make this work. There we go, that's perfect. The scientific fascination about the meteorites is, uh, you know, the, here's an object that fell on the Earth 4,000 years ago, and so we think of that as the distance past. But really, this meteorite has its beginnings uh, even as old or older than the Earth. There is no rock other than a meteorite that you can find on Earth. There is no Earth rock that you can pick up that is older than this meteorite, 4.6 billion years old. I always tell my students it's older than your grandmother. <laughs> so, uh, so I love this slide for, uh, stolen from Scientific American. It's, uh, the meteorites are really emissaries of the past. And as scientists, we want to know how did we get here? How did, how did the Earth get here? How did people get here? And so uh, the, it's fascinating that these, these objects captivate us, whether it's you because of the, you wanting to reunite and the, something about it uh, captivating you. But it's the same from the science point of view. So I don't want to turn this into a, a science lecture, but other than to say uh, studying meteorites and understanding these things really goes to the roots of uh, asking who we are and where we came from. And it goes back to the, the formation, as I said, of uh, how the planets formed. How did our solar system form? Where did we come from? And as far as we know that, uh, you know, Carl Sagan would always say we are children of the stars or that we are made of star stuff, would be a Carl Sagan cosmos kind of thing. And uh, it's really true. We're made out of the stuff that comes from interstellar space. And we think that, uh, uh, over time, uh, uh, some amounts of the gas and dust that are in interstellar space begin to collapse. And this is actually a painting by a very famous scientist artist named William Hartman. He's a fascinating guy. And this is a painting of what he, of, based on his scientific, the best scientific expertise we have, what did the solar system look like when it first started to form? And it was this disk of gas and dust. And you can see the things that, we still sample today as meteorites. You see them as these uh, particles coming together. We call them planetesimals, trying to form into the planets. Anyways, this is a complicated diagram. The disk is full of gas and dust, and it slowly accumulates into planets. And uh, some of those planets get big enough, and they have enough internal heat that the iron inside these bodies starts draining, is melting and draining to the core, just like the Earth has an iron core. Campo de Ciel, this is an iron meteorite. And so it was inside of a small planet, a body that was trying to grow into a planet. And it was uh, molten. This was molten in order to get into the core of this planet. But it didn't get to become a planet. This planet business is just tough. A tough business to get to become a planet. Because instead of uh, being a planet, 
in the asteroid belt, collisions happen all the time. And the planet that this wanted to be a part of was broken apart. And sometimes when asteroids, asteroids collide with each other all the time on geologic time scales. And when asteroids collide with each other, there are different trajectories, but pieces can get flung on paths that take them out of the asteroid belt, bring them to the vicinity of the Earth, and they fall to Earth as meteorites. And anyway, meteorites come in all these amazing flavors, and you can come up uh, and you can pick up Campo de Cielo and say, well, this is a heavy iron meteorite. But then you can pick up this one, and uh, it's almost pure carbon. And this one, which has only a trace of iron and uh, just slight melted amounts of carbon. Um, this one, which has almost no iron at all, and is much lighter than, uh, than the others. But, but we see iron meteorites that fall in other places. And um, it's just an amazing, complicated story. So the, the, the essence of, um, of meteorites is that they, are, they tell a story. They all have a story. The scientific story is about where we came from, where the Earth came from. And the artistic story is about trying to understand um, the long history, the history and the beauty of these. Yeah, the relation with humans. It's all about the humans, and whether it's the human mind or the human spirit that we're trying to, to uh, uh, decode, they, they captivate yeah, us Yeah, and both also, ways. The, you know, once they hit the ground, they, they have now their terrestrial history. So exactly. Campo del Cielo, as we were saying in the beginning, has such a vast history of people that have come across it for so long with their different sets of tools, like Spaniards not even knowing they were coming from the sky, or, or scientists discovering that they were coming from the sky, or, or even, I think El Taco is a great example of what can happen just out of you know, scientific curiosity, to pull it out of its, its, its sight and have the interest to look into it because they wanted to. El Taco was, if I'm not mistaken, it was the first time they had sectioned such a large meteorite in half. It was like a technical accomplishment for the time. Actually, Smithsonian could not perform it, and it had to be cut in, at Max Planck in Germany. So after leaving Argentina, El Taco went to Smithsonian. They tried to see if they could do it. They couldn't, and Max Planck offered to step in and say, we'll do it. And they did, and it. it was the first time they could cut in half such a large specimen, which is also a very sort of simple metaphor to curiosity, like crack open and want to see what's inside. And after that, the fact that it was divided in, in, in two countries, one sitting in, the, in, a, in a museum support center within like the vast collection of Smithsonian and forgotten, and then the one that returned to Argentina sitting outside the planetarium with sort of no history because no one really know, knew anything about it, but it was still visited you know, years after years after years. So putting them back together and each half was a little bit telling their story. Like if they were able to speak, one was rusty because it, it was on the outside and the other one, which now has been, it's being turned around, but it's, it, it's really like, uh, like it's the way that it was when they cut it in half and polished. So when we had these two halves sitting in the room, like Guillermo was mentioning before, we, we were driven at the beginning to maybe like put all the archival work on the wall, but then we decided, no, we have to pull everything out because the halves themselves, they can sort of speak in some sense, if you can see them. And I also want to add something that was very nice about working with... Uh, you know, with a scientist, uh, when, we were, when we were in touch with uh, the curator of the Smithsonian, at the beginning he was very interested and he, you know, he was, it was the first time he actually saw that half. Um, and he was very open to our proposal to putting them back together. We were very lucky that he was in Germany when the opening occurred and he, there was a meteoritic uh, meeting or something and he came to Frankfurt and he was there for the pre-opening of the show, and it was just a bunch of us and family. And, and somebody, a friend of ours, approached him and asked him, which one do you like the best? 
Which the, half? The, yeah, which half? <laughs> Do you like the, your half or the Argentine half? And mm -hmm. he actually said, I like both a lot because <laughs> I can see what this would look like in space, referring to the US yes. one, and I could see what this looks when it hits the Earth because right. they generally rust because they're in the open air. So that was, that was very nice. To, how to how did Frankfurt become the site of reunification? Well, it was uh, the, cro the, the crossroad of, uh, of many things. In a, in, in a sense, it's, uh, it's 40 kilometers from Mainz where it was cut, so it made sense okay. in that way. And then institutionally, uh, we, we chose that place and that moment because uh, there, it was uh, the book fair, and Argentina was a honor guest of the book fair. And we really, as, as uh, the curator of the Smithsonian said, we really needed a very good uh, excuse to, to do it in a moment and not another. So, and also uh, 2010 is the 200 year of the independence. Bicentennial of Argentina. Argentina. And also, when we were invited to, to this residency at Kunzerang, we went to Porticos to see a show, and we like, came out of the place and looked at each other and we said, this is like, the perfect place ever to get together in taco. So there were many, many things converging in that place, and well, it worked. But I want to go back to the human understanding of meteorites, you know, culturally, historically. Um, maybe I can start with Professor Benzel in terms of historically, how have we understood meteorites, and then maybe talk about the cultural reference in the case of the campo. With the artist. Sure. So if we can switch, I'll uh, show you a little bit of the early uh, origins of meteorites. So uh, meteorites have a funny name. Uh, you know, we think of meteorology and meteorologists and weather forecasts. And so meteorites and meteorology seem to have the, the same name. And in fact, it's, it's relatively recent in human thought, uh, only 200 years, that um, we understand that meteorites are samples from outer space. Uh, they were originally thought to be uh, things that were caused by weather. And how do you cause a meteorite by weather? Well, many meteorites are heated and melted, and, and they land at odd places at odd times. And the idea was that maybe somewhere lightning struck the ground, and the heat of the lightning melted the rocks and threw them up into the air, or threw, threw them up into the air. And they landed somewhere else. And, uh, and so they called them thunderstones, and they thought they were meteorological or weather-related, and hence the name uh, meteorites. Um, or they came out of volcanoes. It, it, um, and even in, in uh, you know, classical physics understanding, Newtonian understanding, the, the planets were all like clockwork. You couldn't have space cluttered up with stuff. The planets would run into it, and they would slow down and it just seemed imperfect. So uh, meteorites have wonderful history to them, uh, wonderful episodes to them. One of my favorites in 1492, a fairly, fairly famous year, uh, was in Alsace, so the German-French border. Um, in Eisensheim, a uh, meteorite fell and the, many people saw this rock falling from the sky and the, the plume behind it. And uh, they called it the Thunderstone of Eisensheim. And they, they took it to the local church and they chained it down <laughs> because they didn't want that rock leaving in the same violent way in which it arrived. And uh, to this day, it's still chained to the church. And that, the chains are working. It hasn't, <laughs> hasn't escaped since. Even in American history, there's a, a, a famous tale. And it's a bit of a tale, I think, uh, to Thomas Jefferson, one of the most brilliant presidents uh, in our nation's short history. And uh, Jefferson is reputed to have said he was among the most learned men in, uh, in, uh, in the world at that time. And he is reputed to have said, but there's no actual record of his saying these words. But he said, I would sooner believe that Yankee professors would lie than that stones would fall from the heavens. And he, I'm not sure he was a Red Sox man either. The, uh, but the point was that um, 
this uh, occurred at a, at a, this quote dates to a very important time in history where there was a meteorite fall observed by reputable citizens in the town of Weston, Connecticut, not so far from here, people from Connecticut. And, um, and it coincided with a time, that meteorite fall in Weston, Connecticut, coincided with a fall that was well observed in England at a place called Walled Cottage in 1795 and L'Agla in France in 1803. Uh, it was just a time when there were, as I said, reputable people reliably seeing these events of stones falling from the sky that had no other correlation. And, uh, and these stones that were picked up in various parts of the world seemed to have similar chemistries. And um, the idea began to gel, to crystallize, that these were actually samples from outer space. And an interesting, totally independent event happened in the early uh, 19th century. And that's this guy down here at the bottom, if he barely shows up there in, in the lights, a guy named Giuseppe Piazzi, a Sicilian monk who was at the telescope on January 1st, 1801. And he discovered an object in between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter called, uh, where no planet was known to exist, but people had thought maybe there should be one there. And it was the first asteroid, and it was named Ceres. And we now know there are thousands and thousands of asteroids or leftover debris, or I like to call them the leftover building blocks of the solar system. It's a place where a planet never quite came together. And most of these meteorites, we think, are coming to us today from the asteroid belt, these leftover pieces. And uh, just as an interesting intersection between science and, and human history is uh, I visited up in that upper corner, I visited the site of Piazzi's telescope in, in uh, 2001. At eight, and he made the discovery on January 1st, 2001 at 8 o'clock p.m. And so at 8 o'clock p.m. I joined with the observatory director and his wife and 200 years to the moment of Piazzi's discovery, we raised a glass of Sicilian wine <laughs> to the discovery. And so uh, anyway, the, the point is that there's this, been this e evolution of human thought and understanding for where meteorites come from uh, and the, in that tie to their scientific value. And it's amazing how you have different intersections from different directions that seem to just crystallize at particular moments in history. So in the case of El Campo in your research, you also look at the historical and cultural sort of trace of this and what it means going back to the pre-Columbian times, to the colonial time when they were starting to excavate and make sense of it. Maybe you can tell us a bit about that journey that you documented so well in your book. Well, actually, in the book, uh, there's like a, there's a, yeah, there's like a little bit of a, of a preface to, to this text, which is called a, a, a his, um, Notes for a History of El Taco. And uh, so this, this text that we commissioned to a sociologist historian, uh, we, we brought all our research about El Taco. And, um, and of course, there needed to be some sort of brief introduction within that text of what and where and what it, you know, Campo del Silo is about. So that's where I think he touches base with the pre-Columbian, and it's a little bit of an introduction. But we, we El Taco is really about the, the 60s in some sense. Um, like I, we were mentioning before, we have like these multiple, like this constellation of stories that we're working on, and the book is called like Volume One because we're interested in <laughs> in working on the histories of other specimens that represent these different eras. And uh, actually, what we're presenting here in in the lobby, which should be up anytime soon, is sort of a, a view or a preview of one uh, other history story that we're working on, which is about the Maison de Fierro. It's big iron table. And this is a, um, a, a piece that was about three meters by one by, you know, it was very large, like uh, eight, calculated to be 15 to 18 tons, which was already 
visited by the tribes, and the tribes took the Spaniards out there. Um, and it was visited during 200 years. And in the late 1700s and 1783, there was a very big mission of about 200 men that sit out there. This is in the middle of the desert, so there's like no water. It was a very, like a crazy mission that set out there to, to see what was going on with the Maison de Fierro, and they started digging because they didn't know at that time. That was very close, right? Because it's the end of the, of the 1700s and meteorites were understood to be meteorites in the early 1800s. 1800s so right. that was right at the edge. And, um, and this guy, he sat out there and he, he dug and he dug and he was wondering where this was coming from and, and he described everything in, a, in an account that he submitted to the Royal, uh, to the Royal Society, right? Mm -hmm. And then it was published in Philosophical Transactions and we've been after this story. And this, this story is dealing with this, uh, with this question that you're asking about, like maybe the pre-Columbian times, and which is bringing also uh, many other interesting things to work with uh, related to archive. I mean, this is also related to archive, but like we've set out this quest now to try to see if we can come up with an, uh, um, a strategy to try and find it, because it's believed to be out there. Uh, I mean, something that large that was lost in the late 1700s, it would, it would have been, it could have been, not, it, it would have been impossible for it to be destroyed, I guess, with the tools we, we have. If El Taco was not, like, cut in half in 1962, one would imagine that an 18-ton meteorite could have been, like, sliced down. So we, you know, we're interested now in looking into that story, too. So maybe... Um we can get into this issue of how your next stage of research. Uh, uh, but, but coming back to the current exhibit that you had in Frankfurt, um, how that was put together and how that was sort of curated, uh, maybe you can say a bit more about how as artists you were trying to represent this journey you've taken, the historical, uh, the present, uh, the institutional, uh, in one artistic intervention, or maybe it was a series of artistic interventions. The exhibit perhaps was one of those, and this is continuing. Because again, I'm trying to get at the issue of what we are talking about in this lecture series of, of artistic research practice. And through your project, we're taking a lens on a particular, a peculiar kind of artistic research practice. And, and maybe we can kind of think through what that means for you. No? I think uh, the idea of artistic research um, actually um, arrived to us as a, like, uh, at a really later stage. Like when we began working, we weren't really looking at each other saying, we're doing artistic research. Um, we were just doing what we like to do. And I guess that also the collaborative aspect brought a lot to that, to, to maybe arriving to the idea of artistic research. It was actually someone that mentioned that, mm. or okay. maybe for this invitation. Well, yeah. yeah, or a little bit before, but it was a, we weren't like speculating or interested, like we weren't looking into artistic research as a practice. It was, I no, guess, we didn't even know that it yeah, we exactly. Doing it, yeah. and researching in the meteorites that we didn't have much idea that this existed because in Argentina there's no reference for what we do. And that's why it was so hard to to make the art understand that we were actually doing art. Like everybody knew we were artists and we were doing this, but it wasn't they didn't really know how to deal with what we were doing. And when we got to to Germany it was clear that we were like doing something that maybe it was interesting in, in different aspects, but that existed before. There was like plenty of references, or enough references to upon, uh, what we were doing as art, and, and well, now it seems that it's called uh, artist research, or at least in a... Sort of emerging. Yeah. It's like, also... Uh, yeah, like you, like, you were, like you were saying before, yeah, exactly. We were actually toying around with this idea. Yeah, we do institutional engineering. Like, yeah. you know, that's the name we put to it. Because we, you know, we found ourselves, like, 
like we said at the beginning, like this, this, this history was like speaking back to us. It was asking for stuff, like uh, me meeting the half. It was asking for giving my ad identity back, and I guess that's what triggered everything to move in that direction. And then the book appeared as a result of you know understanding that it really made no sense to put all these historical photos next to a, the, a reunion of the meteorite that the power of, of, of this metaphor had to work by itself. Like actually at Porticus you would walk in and there would be absolutely no text like whatsoever that was informing you, uh, you know, before entering the room to the left or to the right, like this is El Taco. You know, that, and we were actually working on this at, at the space, like days before, you know, this was coming like to an end while we were actually putting the show together. And then, you know, the book came as a, as a, also like a vehicle, like we ended up producing the show where we had two strong pillars, like that were also working with the same gesture of, uh, of, uh, of reunion, like in some sense, bringing back the stones together was the reunion of the stones and its history of meeting again in Germany in the country where it was cut. And then the book was putting together, uh, compiling and and working with all this historical imagery and our own photographs and, and letters and putting together the history. So it condensed like uh, as a, along the way, really. Uh, Professor Benzel, maybe you can help us answer why do meteorites really fascinate us continuously? I mean, you, you, you mentioned there are some very famous meteorite yeah. falls and, and you know, why are artists like this continuing to sort of work on this? Maybe I'll ask the same question to them in another way, but uh, I'd like to hear from you. Sure. Uh, if we can go to the slides, I want to just put into context that uh, you know, we're dealing with something that fell 4,000 uh, 4, years ago. Um, but meteorites come all the time, and uh, there's a little bit of a, the past, the present, and the future, and more or less in the, in the present, uh, things hit, a, hit the earth all the time. There's an arrival of thousands of kilograms per day of dust and things that are always striking the earth. And um, occasionally, and there are, as in we get unusual things like this one we talked about, um, but also uh, sometimes they're a little bit annoying. Uh, here's the case of a meteor that crashed through a uh, roof uh, in uh, Scotland uh, in 1917. So d the point is that the dust hits the earth all the time. There's dust hitting the atmosphere. There's meteor showers, famous meteor showers, the Geminids in the winter, the Perseids in the summer, if you ever you know, hear about going out and seeing meteor showers. But things that are big enough that uh, maybe uh, the size of this table or twice the size of this table before they hit the atmosphere, they're big enough, they're strong enough, they'll survive as fragments. Sometimes they crash through someone's roof. Um, this is the only known case where anyone's ever been hurt by a meteorite that uh, crashed uh, to Earth. A woman was uh, sitting on her couch in Alabama and uh, was struck by a meteorite in 1954. Um, we have a famous painting. This is of a, a fall in Siberia in 1947. And in fact, this is a fragment of this fall, in, uh, in the Sikotalin fall in 1947 in Siberia. And it also happens to be an iron, much like uh, Campo Cielo. Uh, was and something like this, something as spectacular as this, happens uh, once every few decades. So, dust hits all the time. Things that could give us meteorites happen, you know, hand samples, if you will, happen uh, several times a year, mostly over the ocean, but sometimes uh, more noticeably. And then maybe about once per thousand years, something as big as uh, something that hit in Tunguska, Siberia in 1908, uh, which flattened the uh, thousands of square miles of uh, forest. And uh, you can compare the ev area of devastation of the Tunguska uh, uh, Fall to New York, or for better or for worse, talk about institutional engineering, uh, you know, the beltway of Washington, DC. And, um, and so these things happen uh, not very often, but there's potential that when they do happen, good things or bad things could happen about them. So uh, anyway, just some other uh, 
things uh, that happen every decade or so. We see bright bolides uh, again that come. Sometimes, you know, meteorites crash through cars. Famously, meteorites, uh, this one fell in Peekskill, New York in 1992. I like to say this hit, it hit a 10-year-old Chevy Nova. Nova, but it hit a 10-year-old Chevy Nova uh, whose book value was $500. Um, the meteorite in the car were sold for $50,000. So I always offer to my students that they can come to the MIT Meteorite Collection. If they've got an old car, we can make an arrangement and they can, they can pay their... But the uh, car was bought too, right? Yeah, the car and the meteorite were yeah. sold for $50,000. Yeah. Yeah. So if you've got an old car, I've got the meteorites. So we can work something else. And then things fall through the roof even today. Park Forest, Illinois, for our Chicago fans, here's a slice of a meteorite that fell through someone's roof in Park Forest, Illinois. Um, yeah, so meteorites just show up all the time. And uh, here's another roofs. You know, why do they always hit roofs? Well, roofs have a lot of cross section. <laughs> a lot of the Earth's surface or civilized world is covered by roofs. Otherwise, they land in a field, in a farm field, and you don't necessarily find them. So um, anyway, here's a fabulous uh, story, a mix of culture and meteorites that you may know about. This was an asteroid. This object was actually discovered while it was in space and determined that it was on an impact trajectory to the Earth. It was the first time ever an object had been discovered before it hit the atmosphere. And they predicted where it would land. It landed in the Sudan Desert. And I'm sorry I don't have another picture to go with it, but uh, some scientists got together with the locals. And they were able to predict where they should go search. And so it was this massive effort of a scientific team um, uh, with the lo local Sudanese, and you see all the Sudanese in the scientific paper here, that went out and uh, were, would, you know, did a search pattern across the desert. And they actually recovered fragments for the first time. So the first time of, a, of a, observing something in space, predicting it would hit the Earth, and then predicting where one would find it. And, uh, and so the combination, and, 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 a, and a place that had no scientific understanding of meteorites, but they made it work. And all the little red dots, these the little red dots in the image is where they found the actual fragments. Now, I suspect Nicholas and Guillermo are, are, are less interested in the collision value of these meteorites than the cultural and poetic. Um, uh, maybe you can, can speak to some of that as you're curating your work over time. Well, it's quite impressive what he has shown. Um, I guess that we're interested in the other side because scientists are they really, they really research campus here. You know? Like, if we go through through all the investigations, all the research on Campo del Cielo, like we get bored about like all the science because I mean we're not scientists. It's until one point it's very interesting and then it's it's very technical and we can't really offer a view over that. I guess that that's one of the the, the possible answers. And then the historical part it's very shattered so we had, there was a lot of work to to do to put to get the bits together, and we 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 said a few times that uh, that we did the book that we wanted to find. So if the book existed already, we wouldn't be doing this. We would be doing something else. So I guess that we're interested in the side that there's not much uh, done. Yeah, I also think that to bring it like uh, back to our at least our primitive stage of of our project, and maybe related to our to our common interests and our and our love for the cosmos and looking, you know, being kids and looking out into the sky. And I think uh, just to 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 respond to to what you just showed, I, I was just feeling that's beautiful, like. Uh, all those stones falling onto Earth, and and just, I mean, we're interested in Campo del Cielo. That's what we're doing right now, and we, you know, sometimes we have to explain like we're not interested in all meteorites. Like we got emails like, "Hey, a meteorite fell yesterday," you know, and we're like, "Okay, that's good news," but you know, like uh, I don't know. I'm just my focus is on on this one only. But still, I mean, it's it's so nice to see this because I think it it, it made me think about this uh, like. Uh, like 
time space like a paradox of meeting the meteorites like having these guys on the table and and we're always like the most advanced forms meeting them and they're always the oldest forms like arriving although you know you, uh, you can be very technical about each one has a different story or they're like a slice of a, our beginnings but still like uh, to make it very exaggerated in that sense like uh, there's a I don't know, it makes me think like when people stare into the fire, like it's this very basic thing, like when you light a fire, everyone's like looking into the fire. What are you thinking about, you know, like uh, on a philosophical level? I think people can get very moved about it. Well, but when I was saying at the beginning how we are made of the material of the cosmos, mm -hmm. and somehow that material now lets us think about where we came from. And, uh, you know, it's really am amazing to... Uh, when you think about life and the ability to, to uh, have this matter organize itself into a conscious way, um, it, uh, it, it, it's at the fundamental base of, of, of uh, what we wonder about. My, as a professional astronomer, one of my favorite things to do anytime at a major observatory is to go outside and just look up. You know, I've got you know, millions of dollars of equipment and you know, or, you know the critical moment of making that critical measurement is at hand. But if you don't just stop and look up and wonder, then you're probably not doing the right thing. You still have to have that creative sense of uh, just absolute awe of the mysteries. And then there's so many people that actually found stuff, and they're not even like trained scientists, like a uh, shoemaker, like yeah, shoemaker Levy, I mean Gene Shoemaker, and the. You know, just the story of what's the long-term history or what are the impacts to life and evolution that, you know, meteorites or asteroids have had. It's really, a, it's an amazing, interesting, long-term human interrelationship that we've had with these objects. Now, NASA has recently, just in the last two decades, started funding a lot more research on meteorites. Uh, and you're on one of the panels that's involved in that. Maybe you can say a little bit about why is NASA interested at this moment in time uh, what are some findings that your panel is trying to uh, grapple with? Sure. I'm on a, um, a NASA task force. It's called the Task Force for uh, Planetary Defense. And um, we, we basically have as our challenge to try to understand uh, how often do, uh, do things hit the Earth and how often do they hit the Earth when it really matters other than just the beauty and the, the interest of picking one up and analyzing it. Um, and it's really a modern um, bit of thought that asteroids or comets and things out in space could actually affect us badly. And uh, just a quick story there. So, you know, we've seen these movies, fact or fiction. And I always tell my students, you take a tiny bit of fact and you mix it up with a lot of it fiction and you make it entertaining. So almost nothing in those movies is scientifically correct, but they're entertaining. Um, what I like to say is that just the understanding that impacts um, matter or could matter of all is really a, a modern understanding. We, you know, we we find meteorites and uh, and they're odd. They're the odd stones when you find them, but we haven't really thought about impacts affecting life on Earth uh, until the space age. And this is this the planet Venus. Actually, it's a cloud-covered planet, but. When we were able to resolve the surface of Venus with radar, we found craters on the surface of Venus. Of course, we know craters on the moon since the time of Galileo 400 years ago. Almost exactly 400 years ago was in 1409, 1410. I'm sorry, 1610. Um, so 400 years ago was Galileo first looking at the moon, seeing craters on the moon. We see craters on Mars. And so as we began to explore the solar system, we saw craters as a result of impacts, things hitting, large things hitting uh, other bodies that uh, we began to think, wow, maybe these things really matter. And, but we're not used to craters on Earth because uh, we don't see them or we don't see them very easily. That's because we have a lot of water, a lot of erosion. We have a lot of plate tectonics. We have a, uh, the Earth's surface is really very young. so. And the moon's surface and Mars' surface are very old, so they're, if they're craters from long ago, uh, they stay around. But we've been working on this as geologists for the past 20 years. In fact, this was Gene Shoemaker, whose name came up, was a geologist interested in studying craters. And uh, so there are now about 100 craters, 100 locations on the Earth. And there are mineralogic and geologic reasons why we know these are actual impact craters and not just round holes in the ground. 
Um, so I already talked about Tunguska there as an impact site. But I think something that really turned it around was uh, this um, discovery by geologists back in uh, around 1980. And this is, um, this, uh, they're standing next to a rock layer. And this is a slice from that very rock layer, almost like that, almost in that exact spot in Gubbio, Italy. And what you have in the geologic record, you know, think how thick the rock surface of the, the earth is. But in the geologic record, you have dinosaurs. And in this much geologic time, that's the width of a finger, above that is 80% of all the species that were here have disappeared. Include, the dinosaurs are simply the most famous. And in this instant, this blink of geologic time, 85% of all species, including the dinosaurs, went uh, gone or extinct. And what these scientists did, the well, father and son team of Walter and Luis Alvarez, is they, they looked at this layer in between, and it's a clay layer. So you can actually see this clay layer. And they found this spike. They measured uh, abundances of things. And among the things they measured was iridium. Iridium is very rare in the, in the surface of the Earth, in the crust of the Earth, but it's very common in meteorites. And they found that this layer in between uh, that where the dinosaurs went extinct had, uh, had meteorite, had lots of meteorite elements in it. And they hypothesized that there was a giant impact uh, about a 10 kilometer, six mile across asteroid or comet hit the Earth, uh, threw up so much dust and debris into the atmosphere that the world went dark for anywhere from months to years. And, uh, and if you were a large plant-eating uh, animal like a dinosaur and there was no sunlight, all the plants died, you had nothing to eat. If you were somebody who ate those other dinosaurs, once they died off, you didn't have anything to eat either. But if you were a small, furry, four-legged uh, creature that could live off whatever you could find, including dead dinosaur meat, you could survive, and that was mammals. And so the, the age of mammals began 65 million years ago as a result of one of these big impacts onto the Earth. It's really absolutely astounding. And now we find a crater off the Yucatan Peninsula of, of uh, Mexico that has the same age, 65 million years, as this uh, clay layer. So we think about uh, these impacts, all they all, those craters all happened long ago. Well, again, Gene Shoemaker, actually his wife Carolyn, found this comet, which became known as Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9. And we saw in 1994 it hit Jupiter. And so this was a wake-up call that things still hit the Earth today, major impacts. That brown spot, you see that small brown spot, if you can see it, oh, it doesn't show up too well with the lights. Um, it's this impact bruise uh, that was the size of the Earth on Jupiter. And uh, anyway, these craters we now see on Earth, when we say how old are they, we use age date the rocks. And we find lots of craters really young in geologic time, less than 10 million years old. And so we can use all that data, the craters on the moon, these craters on the Earth, to say what's the chance of a big impact in the next 50 years and uh, you know, something that, if it hit the Earth, would ruin just about everyone's day. And fortunately, um, something that bad doesn't happen on the Earth. It, you know, that was 65 million years for the dinosaurs. That was pretty terrific. Um, but something a little less worse than that, probably, but still bad for everyone's day, happens about once per 10 million years. It's not very often. Uh, you know, so that means that the chance of it happening this year is 1 in 10 million. And the chance of it happening in the next 50 years, if you just take that probability over 50 years, it just says that kind of in our lifetimes or in a, in a time scale that we can worry about, 50 years, there's a 1 in 200,000 chance of something really large hitting the Earth. It's not a lot, but it's not zero. And so this task force for planetary defense is trying to look at this and say, should we worry about it or, or not? And I always say, what's the chance in the next hour? You know, you can do this. It's about one in a hundred billion, so probably you'll make it home. You'll probably get more risk driving on Route 2 or 128 or Memorial Drive, uh, walking across Memorial Drive, than you are from an asteroid impact on your way home tonight. But anyway, this is us. We're in the Asteroid Tracking Center, and if you ever see people running out the door like crazy, you want to go, um, go and have that really good bottle of wine. 
Uh, anyway, the, the point is that the chances of asteroid impacts are in the range of uh, the kind of things that we do worry about. And, um, you know, and any time this shows up in the news, it usually is pretty funny. Um, but it, it's right on this hairy edge of something to think about and something uh, maybe it's not so important. So, you know, so what do we do if something is big and, and headed towards the Earth? Uh, oh, this is one of my favorites. Uh, and this actually pretty much sums up what I think the right approach is. Um, is uh, this says, my insurance company, Cretaceous Mutual, of course, why do you ask? And I think it's actually almost like an insurance problem. We don't think this is going to happen, but we have the, uh, we at least have the uh, capability of, of understanding uh, whether or not there's anything out there. So we have all these task force uh, things in place. And what we're doing is now we're advocating to try to uh, get more and more telescopes devoted to surveying these objects. This is a plot over there of just how many objects have been found. And the ones in red are the ones large enough to really ruin everyone's day. And uh, we're getting close to completeness on the really big objects, but the kind like the Tunguska events, the kinds that could wipe out cities or congressional districts, there's uh, hundreds of thousands of those, and we're just scratching the surface of those objects. I mean, here's an example um, uh, just last October of an object flying uh, just inside the, uh, you know, very close inside the orbit of the moon near the Earth. Uh, it missed as most of them do. Here's one that's coming back in November, uh, just inside the moon's orbit. So as we discover more and more of these objects, we see them. We see the Campo de Cielos out there in space as they're going by. They don't have to stop in for us to see them. We're now getting more and more capability to see them as they go by. And in fact, this article in the Globe uh, is uh, my postdoc. Uh, we actually sit in our lab here at MIT and look at these objects with a telescope. Telescopes in Hawaii and we sit and control the telescope uh, from here. Though this time of year, we think we really have to go recalibrate everything in Hawaii. Uh, so uh, we have a very famous asteroid, or a very famous case. It's an asteroid named Apophis that we've discovered uh, is going to come back very close to the Earth on April 13th, 2029. It's a Friday. And if it were to hit the Earth, uh, it would take out something the size of Cleveland. I'm not sure anyone would notice, but just as a sense of scale. And so what do we do? So this is among the things this task force is uh, starting to think about. If we really had to do something about it, what would we do? Do we try to blow it up or try to nudge it? And we think probably just pushing on them is the better thing to do. Um, but we really don't know what we're dealing with. So that's kind of what we're doing here at MIT, just to bring it into the campus, where we operate that telescope in Hawaii sitting here on campus. And uh, we make these measurements of the color. We take these color spectral fingerprints, try to link them to different kinds of meteorites. So we actually, even though these objects are passing the Earth uh, in space, we try to say, ah, this meteorite, in fact, this meteor asteroid Apophis, we think is very much like this kind of meteorite, something called an LL chondrite. And uh, if we know about this meteorite, then we have all these physical things that uh, we we know what that asteroid's probably made out of in case we have to do something. So it's this link. They're coming by. They're passing by. We're, th we're glad they're not stopping to visit. But if they were, uh, we're trying to be as smart as possible about what they are and what to do with them. So, so um, you're actually you're going to land a ship also on an asteroid, right? So we have, uh, we have um, we've had spacecraft missions to asteroids. We, I'm on a proposal team, one in Europe and one in the United States, to go and land on one of these, uh, um, pick up samples. There's talk of sending humans to asteroids just as a way of uh, challenge on the way to Mars. We'd, ultimately, the goal is to get to Mars. And there are many of these asteroids in near Earth space. Or actually, you can practically stop at them for free on the way, or as you want to practice how, how to get to Mars. Well, that's maybe what we're doing. And I, I always like to say, anytime I give talks about asteroids and say, oh my gosh, we're all going to die, um, I think really it's going to end up that the asteroids are our friends, that uh, you know, some of these contain water. And uh, maybe we'll be able to use them and mine them in the future. So we always hear about the asteroids always show up in the movies, and they're bad. They're always disasters. Um, but I think ultimately they're going to be quite uh, useful resources for us. So just coming back to our terrestrial asteroid that you've been investigating for five years now, 
Uh, maybe you can map out for us where your research is going. You're here for a week. Uh, you're visiting scientists at MIT and you're trying to develop a collaboration. Um, maybe you can tell us what you're trying to do in the next phase. Well, um, as Nico said, uh, when we began uh, researching Campo del Cielo, we, we began to follow different stories. And one of these is the one of, uh, of El Mesón de Fierro. Uh, El Mesón de Fierro, that it's a big uh, iron that uh, was lying in, in the middle of this nowhere, that is uh, Campo del Cielo. And it was seen by the, by the people that was living there. The, the meteorite fell 4,000 years ago, the Campo del Cielo, and there was people living there since 7,000 years ago. And these people brought the Spaniards to see the, the Mesón de Fierro, that was the biggest chunk of iron around. And as uh, we, we tend to believe that it was a really, um, it was a reference point in this uh, big uh, desert. Yeah, there was, uh, this desert is, uh, it's the, the, the biggest mineral uh, is, um, is sand. So there's sand and big chunks of, of iron. So, uh, one can imagine that one can imagine that uh, these people use it as a reference point, like go to the iron and turn to the left. So um, this meteorite was uh, lost by the by the last mission that, that went there. That it it it, uh, it it's usually referred as uh, the first one of the first scientific missions in in Latin America. They thought that it came from from the Earth, that it was like the tip of a uh, of, a, of an iron mill or something like that because they, they, they still think by that time that there was, a, a, there was silver involved. So they dig a hole next to the meteorite trying to look for the roots. And as they didn't find the roots, uh, we, we usually say that they dig like an artificial crater. They push the meteorite inside the crater and then the legend says that the, the original habitants uh, just uh, um, covered it. Covered it, and and it's missing since then. These uh, these uh, people that went to see the meteorite, they just uh, took the latitude and they didn't uh, make a good covering of the of the coordinates. So since then, 1783, there was uh, constant missions to try to find the meteorite. Uh, for example, well, there was uh, many, but um, uh, there was a law in 1870-something that, uh, that, that offered a prize for anyone who finds the meteorite because this province that used to have a, a jurisdiction over this uh, a desert, they lost the jurisdiction and there was a law, like a national law, saying that the, the province uh, gets until the meteorite. So they were very eager to find the meteorite because that would like... Uh, like uh, uh, like push their their own uh, border like a uh, lot more than it is uh, uh, nowadays. So they offer this prize. So there was uh, many missions trying to find it. Even uh, William Cassie had the dream of finding the the long uh, uh, lost uh, Mison de Fierro, but nobody seemed to to find it. Uh, uh, there there are no uh, reliable clues. Uh, but what, what, what was uh, appeared like uh, 10 years ago, there was these people like uh, sending pictures of a meteorite. There's a meteorite being found in Campo del Cielo like uh, very often, like there's even people harvesting meteorites. But they harvest meteorites this size or even bigger, but we're really talking about something the size of this table and like a very big chunk of iron, but it's also very historical. So these people were like sending photos of, of the meteorite to people around the world trying to sell it. And Bill Cassidy got uh, these pictures and he said, this really looks like the Mison de Fierro. Because the last mission, uh, the ones that uh, lost the meteorite, they made a very, uh, very like uh, uh, descriptive drawings of the meteorite. So it looks, it kind of looked like the Mison de Fierro. So, but it's not clear because the site doesn't really match, and also, like, it's not clear. So one of, uh, what, what we want to do is uh, with uh, 
and some of the theories and MIT is like in first is like try to see like uh, if it's possible that this uh, meteorite uh, that it's in the picture could be the same one as it was drawn in 1783 and then uh, like it's like it's a drawing and it's a picture and then the meteorite if you see it this way then if you turn it it really changed the shape so I, we don't think it's very possible to say that's the meteorite it could be the meteorite so what's the possibility like maybe 70 percent 50 10 percent and then nowadays what would be the the right uh, uh, or what like uh, the technology what we have, that we have available what would be like uh, the the different plans to look, to make a full survey of the area. Campo de Silva is a uh, hundred kilometers by four. So how, how uh, the scientists today would uh, try to find like a, a 18 ton meteorite in a hundred kilometer uh, area. So that would be like one of, one, two of the so questions. That's part of the question now. Uh, Nicholas, for you, finding the meteorite isn't the end goal. Really, it's, 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 there's an artistic process that you're going through, uh, and for you, just going through that process is just as important as finding it. Maybe you can say something about. It. Yeah, I mean, I think you ju you just said it. I mean, we we're we're very interested in in the path that we can create and what this means, like what type of uh, of canvas or fabric this could be to look for it for us for our for our project. How we could, you know, like this, this, and the book found its way and its matter, and and we, we, you know, we're interested in, in going into this other story that Guillermo is describing and, and see what types of materials we can work with to tell this story because ultimately this is about a story. I mean, for instance, the book has we're not in the book. I mean, the book is not about us. The book is about compiling all of the history of El Taco. We compile the history up until we appear. So this is like, uh, like making history for El Taco, for ourselves. It was about making history, like writing history on it, not only giving it back its identity and, and trying to deal with its history of what happened, but also like now like giving it another spin, like, like we did. So in some sense, we were ultimately working with a story and, and storytelling, I guess. So this Maison de Fierro description that Guillermo did is also working with another story that's about another time. And, and like I was saying before, it's about a man at another moment. You know, we were talking today over lunch about this, this idea that the meteorite is actually like mirroring us. Like, it's just mirroring us in some sense of who was in front. Campo del Cielo is our case study. It's mirroring different moments. So Mason de Fierro will mirror other aspects that we can be interested in telling or dealing with. And I don't know. Great. Uh, because we're at a good point in our um, talk today, why don't we open up the floor and have a conversation with the audience? And maybe uh, folks here um, might have some insights about extending this work further or just some critical questions about your process. Yeah. So okay. if anyone would like, uh, we can pass this microphone around. I think it's an amazing story, and it's uh, what I. Um, what strikes me is how does this, how does a, it's a rock, but somehow it captivates you, and uh, and what is it? So to me, it's the essence of what is it that how it captured you, how it captured your imagination, and uh, so maybe that's a question. It, was it because you knew it was from space? 
was that the motivation or you knew or it was just the, the feeling of of incompleteness I mean I have all these meteorites in the collection and they they tend to be slices because it doesn't cost as much that way and um, you know so what was it or you know can you describe what it was that led you on this quest uh, anyway I, mean, I, I find the quest fascinating um, and just to get to the heart of what what was it I know what captivates me about these the rocks um, and it's their stories that they have they have they're telling me about something four and a half billion years ago that I have no other way of knowing. Uh, and they're time capsules. So like if you dig up a, a time capsule from a century ago, you're fascinated to see what clues about how they lived or uh, what there was. So, so I know why I love them. So anyway, what, what, also, what, what think captivated you the most? Yeah. The other part of the question was oh, yeah. what, what do you think actually contributes? Uh, their work might contribute to the scientific. Uh, well, I, I think it's the context. I think, to me, it's the context, uh, like uh, Tim McCoy, the Smithsonian curator, said. When he finally saw the two halves together, he had an entirely new context of what this body was and where it came from. And, I, and I'm a big picture context kind of guy. So, I, is, you know, so to me, I, I, there's beauty. There's beauty in the context of having them back together. Um, mm, yeah. Yeah, we could see that too, when when that happened, and how, you know, our interest was trying to, we were trying to deliver like uh, this to a, a a broader audience, like you know, not being elitist or, you know, like only addressing like uh, the art scene or, you know, of course this was a a joint venture of science and art and research and many things and. And I think um, about your question, I guess the basic things, no? Like curiosity, like not taking no as an answer, like not taking like uh, wrong facts uh, for granted. Like I think, uh, like for instance, responsibility appeared uh, within our practice, like trying, trying to set the record straight in some sense. Also, I would go back to this idea that the meteorite it's itself they are a very strong source for keeping us working and researching and like uh, maybe what got us to the meteorites was like I don't know like at that time I was interested in moving heavy things to, to an art space and like meteorite itself, like the fact that they are older than Earth, like that's really like, it's like a, it's a wake up call for for anybody, like not only for art. What we love about our show in Frankfurt, it has it really brought a lot of people that never went to that space before. They were willing to see the two halves of the meteorite. It wasn't about art that they got there. So like, I think it's a, it's a very strong source, the meteorite itself. I'm wondering... Right, you're on. I'm wondering, before you even had the idea for the project, and then during the research leading up to the exhibit, and then since the exhibit, just spending time watching meteors. <laughs> Uh, you can't see the sky very well in Buenos Aires. <laughs> it's a big city and there's a lot of light, like, uh, but, but no, yeah, I guess, like, I was, I think at some point while we were talking, I mentioned the fact that when he was, when he was showing all these lights of all these other events, like, makes you think about just the beauty of what, you know, what you just said, like, looking into the sky and, you know, even, like, looking at satellites run around, I think it's... Well, uh, each one has a story, so the one of the car, the, with the, um, the, the uh, you know, they just heard a noise. Well, what, what, uh, what's interesting about this Peekskill Fall is it was on a Friday night, and uh, there are all these home videos of, of high school football games mm -hmm. up and down the East Coast, and so you see the cheerleaders or the the football players and then the the moms or the dads with the video cameras 
suddenly yank the camera up into the sky and they see this blazing fireball going through the sky. And, uh, and so this thing was tracked uh, for hundreds of miles down the coast before it happened to land and hit this, this car in Peekskill, New York. And uh, when they, they heard the sound, uh, uh, when it hit the car, they heard the sound and they called the police because they thought it was vandalism, that someone had come and beat up the trunk of their car and they didn't have any reason why. And they even found the rock that they, the vandals used <laughs> sitting there underneath the trunk of the car. And it wasn't until there was the combination of the reports that people had seen something coming into the atmosphere uh, and uh, this thing uh, hitting the car that they put it all together. And, and uh, anyway, this, there are, each one is a story, and it's, and it's a scientific story and a human story. So. Any more questions in the back? Besides this project, which other projects you do before? Any project you could describe before? Uh, this is the first project we've done together. Mm -hmm. This is our first uh, collaboration. We, we know each other for as long as the project, actually. Um, so we began working together basically on, upon looking into this, this history of Campo del Cielo. But we've had both dif different things going on. Can you say a little bit about your previous projects and maybe that might relate to the audience? I have, a, I'm a, I'm a, I have a background in photography and I've been working on different documentary driven projects, I would say. And also installations, video? Uh, no, uh, that's, no, that's, no, that's no, I don't know. Yeah, well, I work in. First show in 2000. I, I worked with photography a lot, but I was working more in installation of those those photos in the space, or working with the space and then deciding what to put, what pictures to put, like constellations of, of pictures you know, to, to set up like spaces with, with images. And then I worked in installation and sculpture and yeah, curating shows with friends, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Seth Montalas uh, is intrigued because also he curates and, and uh, does a number of artistic projects in public uh, spaces. And I wonder if part of the question is also looking at the way you thought about this exhibit versus your prior exhibits uh, and how that might have uh, influenced. Uh, yeah, I guess it's about the space. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, like uh, the space as the place where things happen, yeah. I get intrigued by your comments uh, when you sort of how to put these pieces in this room to decide that they just live, they, they just stand on their own, you don't need any more information. And for me, I mean, we, we can attribute a lot of, give a lot of meaning to our knowledge so a point of years ago, people looked at these and thought had very different reflections on what they mean with science. We have much more context that we attribute, and that's what fascinates us. We, we project things into them. And uh, so in some ways, I would like to challenge your views that they just stand on their own, because we, there's a lot of context that we know as meteorites, people have these imaginations. And if we, were, if we didn't know that they were meteorites, people would say, well, So just using these as sort of projection surfaces for, for our imagination of you know, our ultimately our cosmos is a very powerful uh, is a very powerful context for things. Uh yeah, sure. Um, the the process of imagining how this would finally end up as a show was a very, like it took many months, like even you know, while we were actually working and dealing with the loans and getting all these institutions on board, etc. We were all the time meditating about what it would be to, to show this, like, you know, that the history of this, of these halves is so important and vital. 
And uh, like we were saying before, you know, at the beginning we were imagining all these, all this research sort of in the room. But then we started to believe and, and feel that we were maybe standing uh, or, or layering too much on top of the, of the meter of the halves themselves, that people that would walk in would be maybe too filtered already or, or would already uh, be forced to feel or look or experience this encounter through our lens in some sense, if you can say it that way. And uh, as, as we started to, to talk about this, like we started taking out stuff, like, no, that should et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but then, because of, like Guillermo was saying, we thought about it for the space. This space has this deck, this viewing deck. So what we did was we, we used this deck, this viewing platform, as a location to find this history. So you would see, you would walk into the room, the, the institution had a banner outside, it said Meteorite del Taco. So, you know, meteorite, maybe you can wonder if it is a meteorite or not, but at least someone's telling you it's a meteorite. And then if you would go upstairs to the viewing deck, you would have this takeaway piece that we produced where we put this, this story on it, actually like what you're looking at. And then the book was available. So in some sense, we split this sort of thing about how do we deal with the history and how do we deal with the encounter of this history. And, and also, I, I mean, you know, we also feel like uh, it was bringing people to experience a little bit like we did. Like, what is this? What, you know, where is this half? Where is this? All these questions that we had. So, you know, maybe someone could walk in and just enjoy the fact of encountering a meteorite in, in the sense of this is the oldest thing like I'll ever see and it comes from so far away I can't even imagine and here I am and just have a very intimate moment in a white room with the stone and then if you were just a little bit more curious I guess in like uh, like we were like what is this about you could it was available so I don't know if this answers your your question but I'm curious why if you, I mean, you, aren't, you answered before why you chose to bring it to Frankfurt, but why not reunify it back at the original site in Argentina? North, if you, in Campo del Cielo. If you were to do that, what would that mean for the local population? Who You, you wouldn't necessarily exhibit in the white walls of the gallery, but maybe in a much more, uh, in a way different way. Uh, is that something you've considered, or, or why not? Well, it's a matter of possibilities. Like, uh, it's very expensive to do a show like this one, and I don't think that nobody would pay for that. And they, these rocks come from a very, very poor province. So, beginning by that, like, there's a lot of poli political uh, implications. Right. So, like, for instance, if you bring a mitra to Campo del Cielo, it would be very difficult to take it back. So I'm sure that the Smithsonian would think like twice or three <laughs> times if, if, uh, if uh, lending this meat right to Argentina, especially to Campo del Cielo. Yeah, we, we had to work around also our limitations. You know, like this curator was very specific. We'll not give it to you, and you have to find a very good reason and a very good moment for this to happen. And also, I, you know, I don't really think it's about the object. You know, like we're exhibiting something that's not even ours. One half is owned by the U.S. and the other half is owned by Argentina. But the history can be owned by everyone. So in some sense, you know, like whatever do the domino effect of this was actually very positive to, uh, for Argentina, for this history, for this community. Like, you know, we're very much... Uh, in relation with this community and this region. Like, we've been there like seven times. Our first actions that we did there were related with heritage. We're very interested in the aspect of heritage, like who owns what. Even the, the history of El Taco is very complex. This was a, was a meteorite, it was taken from Argentina as a loan. Uh, then it was cut in another country, then it ended split up. So there's questions of, of heritage in there. And the book is dealing with this too. 
and you know, we're not like saying or pointing fingers, but bringing up its history, I think, was a responsibility. Yeah, it comes up all the time. Um, by uh, most laws, if it's on your land, if it lands on your house, lands on your car, lands on your property, however you want to define property, it's yours. Uh, just like mineral rights that are below your property are yours. And so uh, it becomes a, quite an international issue of how, uh, if a meteorite lands in Argentina, how does it get to the United States? know who has the right to sell it uh, and now uh, most countries now have national you know, if a meteorite falls in your country you may not be able to sell it it may be a national treasure and not a personal treasure and, and it becomes very complicated very fast and so and you ran into a lot of issues I mean uh, with this so you know so how it became you know the history of how half of it ended up in the Smithsonian isn't clear either, uh, no, it's not clear. Yeah. but I have to say that uh, by and large, I mean, uh, if you want to buy a meteorite, you can go on eBay or meteorites.com or whatever, and you find meteorites. And most of the people who are selling them are actually reputable, so that's a good thing. But um, I have to say that the people who collect them or find them and want to make a living or a profit off of them are very mindful, by and large, very mindful of the science and the education aspects and all, everything in the MIT collection. Most of it's come through different dealers, people who deal in meteorites, and they've been very, almost to, uh, with, without exception, been very kind, very generous in wanting to see that, uh, that these are teaching tools and that the, the science message and the inspirational message they have gets out. tomorrow in the lobby of building E14, which is the new media lab building. Uh, they'll be showcasing this work, and I think they said uh, tomorrow around 5 o'clock, uh, if you'd like to come, uh, they'll be there to, to, uh, to talk about it and, and give you a first-hand view. Uh, so that's uh, important. And you're both here till Wednesday yeah. and, and hope to come back in the future for extended research collaboration. So maybe I'll leave you with the last word this is anything else you want to say about the exhibition and your work going forward. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's like dream come true. When we were invited, we like uh, um, we were actually in Frankfurt and we were contacted through Facebook, <laughs> and uh, and and we had lunch and and Thomas from the Siemens Foundation who is also, like, this is a collaboration. We, our, our, our book had just been, like, printed. It wasn't even bounded. Like, the, the stones hadn't even arrived to the space. And we had this lunch, and then he said, I uh, would love to invite you to MIT. And it was just insane. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Neither could him. So, I mean, we're so happy, yeah. My mom cried. <laughs> <laughs> Really glad to have you, and also thank you, Professor Benzel, for um, giving us this. Really yeah, thank you, thank, you so thank you so much. Uh, view of history, current ongoing impacts for your planet. Um,
I'd like to just remind you, the next couple of lectures will happen always on Monday evenings. Um, we have a whole lecture series. You can find them outside or sign up for announcements. And uh, I'd like to also thank the Simmons Foundation for making this exhibit possible and to Utamit Abauer for uh, extending uh, an invitation to have the artists come here. So uh, thank you all for being part of this proceeding. Bravo.